hello from my side and welcome. We will recarbonize the audience for this uh, panel. Uh, the topic is all about carbon, so we need to do it. Uh, the next uh, years, we already see the energy transition is coming. We will see it happening in the next years or decades. But in this year, we have a smaller but quite important transition. This is the first time that we will see some large-scale CO2 tax being applied to vessels in operation. We have the ETS next year, we have the fuel EU the year after that, and then we have whatever IMO brings in terms of CO2 tax. And uh, we have been hearing quite a lot of new terms, uh, carbon offsetting, carbon trading, uh, carbon cost uh, allowances. And this is something that is um, new for the technical managers, at least in the big cluster of Greece. And uh, we have a, a lot of new terms, but they are already within our uh, daily routine and uh, start to become our new language. And uh, to shed some more light in this, we have uh, our excellent panelists here. We have Jacopo Pisetti, co-founder of Ether Group. Mr. Simon Bennett, Deputy Secretary General of ICS, International Chamber of Shipping. Mr. Stavros Niotis, Chief Sustainability Officer of Prime Marine. Mr. Theo Baltazis, Managing Director of Technomar. And Mr. Frederick Boutelier, Head of Shipping in Vertis Environmental Finance. I would start from the elephant in the room to address to Simon, representing a larger um, part of the industry. So we saw MEPC 80 bringing a quite stricter greenhouse gas strategy. And uh, the big question is, uh, how achievable do you see these new targets to be? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity for ICS to participate in what's been a really interesting discussion um, this day. So ho hopefully I will complement and rather than duplicate what's come before. Um, I, I should just explain for those who aren't familiar that ICS is the Global Trade Association for Ship Owners. So our role is to represent the industry at IMO, including the very complex negotiations on CO2 reduction. But our members are the world's National Ship Owners Association. All our members are important, but that also includes the Union of Greek Ship Owners, who are very important amongst our members. Um, so to the question, um, yes, the GHG reduction targets set by IMO are um, incredibly ambitious. So starting with 2050, we now have, as we heard from Dr. Rahim from NK this morning, um, we now have the net zero target for about or close to 2050. Regardless of the nuances of that target, ICS is fully committed to helping the industry achieve net zero by 2050. And, and that's consistent with the announcement we made at COP26 in, COP in Glasgow um, about two years ago. As we've heard already, we're only going to achieve net zero regardless of the improvements we make with operational efficiency and new technologies, we're only going to achieve net zero if we see a rapid acceleration um, of the production and uptake of the new green fuels. The 2040 target, that's a 70 to 80% reduction um, throughout the sector compared to 2008. That's only 17 years away. That is exceedingly ambitious. But I, I think it's actually more helpful at the moment to focus on the 2030 target, which is as a sector to achieve a cut in total GHG emissions between 20 and 30 percent by 2008. And, and we think that that is just about achievable. Um, a lot will depend on trade growth. That sector, that target applies to the sector, not to individual ships. But a lot will also depend on the um, availability of sustainable biofuel blends, not least because we expect that ship owners are going to have to comply with the new 
um, global fuel standard that we expect to be agreed in 2025. But another target which is often overlooked that was agreed was what we call the alternative fuels target and that was actually initially proposed by ICS and what's been agreed is that between um, 10 and 20 percent of the energy used by international shipping in 2030 has to be generated from um, near zero or zero GHG fuels that that's by 2030 and the purpose of that is to achieve a takeoff point um, which will then make the 2040 and 2050 goals uh, achievable. It's really important now that to achieve this takeoff point, we find some mechanism to incentivize the first movers. It's really important now, as we heard earlier, that we find a way, or governments help us find a way, of de-risking um, the investments so we have a clear signal to energy producers and ship owners. What we need to do is find a way of um, narrowing um, the price gap between the new green fuels and the conventional fuels that we use today. And hopefully we'll have a chance to explore that further later. Thank you, Simon. I think this goes well with what Rasmus said earlier about uh, doing things fast compared to other industries as well. If we are too late to do things, we, it may be too costly for shipping. Uh, Theo, would you like to give also the owner's perspective on this? Well, uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, I tend to agree with Tony, uh, but uh, I cannot see too many options ahead of us. Uh, the new IMO regulations at some point could be considered as penalizing uh, the whole industry, however, I guess that uh, there are, they have to be seen from a different angle. Definitely, as uh, Tony said, we have to, have to scale up the production of uh, new fuels. R&D has to be implemented, and uh, additional uh, fuel development, the, the so-called green fuels, have to uh, come up uh, rather soon, I would say. Another element is the supply chain of this fuel has to be uh, extremely developed, which is, uh, as we speak, uh, is uh, absolutely uh, zero. And uh, last, I would say, but the most important items, uh, these uh, new regulations uh, have an effect that uh, rightly said earlier on on a different panel, uh, has to bring uh, all the stakeholders of the industry close together. Collaboration, cooperation between the chain, the stakeholders has to be developed dramatically. I guess that uh, we have a rough road ahead of us, but definitely shipping somehow will find a way. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have improved the past years quite a lot as an industry on the collaboration. And still there is room to improve, but we have done the first steps. But with that, I would like to switch the timeline to something shorter and go to the ETS. So in less than three months now, the global fleet, the, the fleet, the vessels calling EU ports will be subject to CO2 tax. Uh, this is something that is happening and we need to, to manage it, to handle it. It may be new to shipping, but it is not new in general. E EU ETS has been running since 2008 for other industries, and uh, I think we have quite a few things to learn from them. So I would like to address to Jacopo uh, the question, how has it worked for the other industries, and uh, what can we learn from that in shipping? Thank you, Jason. So uh, as you said, the ETS is uh, nothing new. So it's been around uh, for more than a decade uh, now, uh, actually 15 years and counting. but. Indeed, it will be new, and it is new for the shipping industry. So if we take a look how the ETS has worked uh, in the past, first for industrials, which are nowhere near shipping, and then for aviation, which is somehow similar to shipping, not exactly the same, actually, very different, but uh, also um, trading through different type of routes and not being rooted in a single country, uh, there are some lessons to be, to be learned. And one of the first, um, the first examples that we see is that 
although not as shipping who will enter the mechanism with zero free allocation compared to the other sectors, which in the case of industrial had 100% free allocation at the beginning, and aviation had roughly 80% free allocation, shipping will have zero. But compared to the other sectors, shipping will have a phase-in period. So as you probably already know, uh, first year you will have to surrender 40% of your obligation and 70% the year after, and then finally be completely phased in uh, by the third year, uh, having to surrender 100%. Compared to um, the beginning of this talk, I hear a lot of um, uh, speakers address this as a tax. It's not really a tax, and the reason why I say this is because compared to a tax, the ETS is uh, a commodity. A commodity which, of course, you will have to pay. It's not a choice, uh, but it, as every commodity, it can be traded and it can be optimized. So the trading and optimization of the trading of this commodity can actually make a difference between your company staying profitable in the business or your company simply having to comply with an obligation without being an active participant. So the main difference that we've seen in all these years is that this, especially with the current prices, which are trading around 80 euros, uh, is an element in any business that it's touched and regulated with a market-based mechanism, in this case the UTS, uh, being able to proactively manage your exposure to such a, a market is paramount to keep competitiveness. On the short term, um, most of the critics say, well, it's, it's you know, um, a tool for polluters to keep polluting. Not really, it's actually a tool to push them out of the market if not dealt with correctly. Uh, my experience in the past 15 years in, the, in this market, basically doing exclusive ETS, is that companies who tend to be proactive, so start engaging with trading strategies similarly as they would edge fuel or other type of commodities, um, and treat this not, not as an obligation when you, know, you will be liable to surrender these units in September 2025 for the first time, but start managing this right away, even before uh, the compliance starts, and that's what we've seen with, with a number of players, uh, normally take a competitive advantage, not only because they start to learn how this mechanism works before others, but also because they tend to learn how the market dynamics work and how to engage with them in a proactive and potentially, in some cases, profitable way. So instead of perceiving the UTS as simply as a burden, um, being proactive can transform this into an opportunity. And I know it might sound very strange by now, uh, but it actually is. Since everybody, I always make this example with clients, you're all starting, starting from the same starting line, in a, in a sense. You're all, all be, gonna be covered by the UTS. Might as well be a good option to start taking a look before uh, you're actually liable or a month passes before you need to comply. Um, let's not forget uh, one thing. Um, the UTS prices is correlated with a number of uh, other commodities, um, so generally the energy uh, sector. Uh, but let's also not forget, by the entry of the shipping sector into the UTS, this will add 15% to the global demand of the UTS, when at full speed, of course, to a number or a pool of units, which is not going to increase, but is actually going to decrease. So by the laws of uh, demand and offer, as you can understand, the price is bound to, to slowly but surely increase. Of course, you'll see volatility, but, but this is where, where uh, most of the direction is going to go. So I would say, uh, lesson to be learned, don't take yourself last minute, but be proactive. This is a commodity, not a tax, so you can play with it. Quite a good uh, advice, uh, although I'm not sure how it goes for the other industries. For shipping, it was quite last minute. So I'm still surprised by the amount of companies that do nothing about it. And in three months, they will need to do something. And with that, I would like to address this question also to Stavros, coming from a ship owner uh, point of view, to, to give us his insight on how the company can start preparing. Yes, thank you, Jason. And thank you for inviting us on this uh, very interesting event. Um, ETS, actually, we, we have been watching very closely the, uh, the trend of the uh, ETS price over the, the last uh, couple of years now, one and a half year. We have opened up also communication with uh, traders and brokers in this market. Uh, as very well uh, mentioned by Jacobo, ETS is a, is a commodity. And to our understanding, it's a quite volatile market. 
and uh, also our understanding from the discussions that we had also with other industries and uh, friends from other industries that they are already trading in this market. This market is highly controlled by hedge funds and speculators. So that means that uh, there is a, a high risk and a high volatility on that. Of course, it's a fully regulated market, commodity market. There are futures um, trading in that market, definitely. And this market and these, uh, the, the, the derivatives show that there will be uh, an important increase on the carbon credit. Currently, the spot market is at 85, as you said. The futures, they are close to 120 or even more than that. So definitely, it will play an important role. What we have done from our side, we have, by the way, we have lately seen an increase in interest from other ship owners and friends in the industry. They are also looking, and maybe they have already done some further steps ahead of us. Um, but uh, mainly, the most important thing that I think we, we did was to open up the discussion with our clients, with the charters, and see how they are approaching that. Our understanding is that they are already trading. Okay, and the, the, the good thing is that we, we, we have reached a, a, a quite common understanding on how we, we should approach that. Um, and we have pretty much fixed our strategy on the commercial policy, how, because we are also doing commercial management of, of the ships. So we, are, we have pretty much fixed how we, we are going to um, manage commercially our ships in the future and, and how we are going to behave uh, on the on charter party agreements. On top of that, however, we feel that we still need to, um, to have, uh, to take some actions, even from now, in order to be able to uh, de-risk the exposure into this market. So to, to, to have some balance. Of course, uh, this highly depends on the type of the ship that you are operating, um, uh, the type of the market that you are in, if you are in a spot market or a liner market. So I definitely I see that container ships uh, would have a totally different approach. But from our end, uh, this is how we are trying to look at that. Thank you. And uh, since we are in luck to have a representative from another ship segment, Theo, would you like to have a word as well? Thanks a lot, uh, and happy to be here. As we are in Greece, I'd like to start with this uh, say from Senec. If one does not know to which port one's selling, no win is favorable. And I think it's, it's kind of reflecting what we've been hearing since the beginning of this uh, session. I'm head of shipping of Vertis. Vertis is a MIFID II regulated company. We are trading in the US since the inception of the EU ETS. As it has been mentioned, EUS is a regulated product, um, and we are telling that for aviation and, and, uh, and industries, obviously, in significant volume um, every day. What I think is important on that issue is to be extremely practical, because I think that's what people are looking for, uh, concrete answers. And I think one of the important points is to try to establish what is your uh, uh, how to tackle at best and how to master at best your compliance strategy because obviously here we are not talking about the voluntary carbon market but the regulatory carbon market. Obviously, maybe four points to, to highlight here very uh, uh, briefly. Uh, first of all, it's a financial market, it's a commodity, so you should be able to understand at best what is driving that market, it's very important. Again, if suddenly there is a cold winter, uh, the consumption of energy is going to increase, and it's likely to have an effect on the price of EUS, and so forth, and so on. I mean, the, the, the examples are multiples. So knowing your market is the first step, obviously. This mechanism has been set up for, by the EU to bring the EUS towards the abatement cost, so towards more energy efficiency. That's obvious. Um, but it's not going to be a linear product curve. And, and obviously, it's, I would say there is a lot of volatility uh, every day, almost. We can see 5, 10% volatility in one day. 
Um, today we have actually, we are actually, as we speak, trading now at around 79. So clearly, there is volatility, but that volatility means also opportunity, and that should be able to be used to optimize your entry point. The third point, obviously, is I would say structurally and on the documentation. I mean, we all know that it's going to be uh, the compliant entity will be either the, the, the ship owner or the dock entity holder, but that means that also uh, the, 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 the shipman co should be clearly uh, cover that element. And we also all know that the charters are likely to take on board the financial cost of the uh, EU ETS. But again, that should be also clearly uh, established in the, in the commercial documentation. So that's the third step in terms of the, the, the documentation to make sure that things are organized in the most efficient way. And last but not least is to establish your trading strategy. And it's not cheese or dessert, it's a mix of a strategy based on the volume which is basically known because you know your MRV numbers. It's a strategy that can obviously be based on the uh, price or trying to optimize your entry point, sorry, to obviously make sure that you have in your books EUS that are at the lowest possible cost. And last but not least, I would say it's even more important. It's a strategy based on the cost path through, i.e. the timing of the purchase of the EUS is generated by the moment you can pass the cost to the charters. For example, uh, if you are today a ferry, and we are trading with ferry uh, companies, they are already selling tickets for 2024. So they need to already integrate in their cost and ticketing cost uh, an element of price related to the EUA. So that's, that's all these elements are very important to build up your um, uh, and master your compliant, uh, compliance uh, strategy. Thank you, Frederic. I think um, you mentioned also the cost and the charters, and uh, I think this is the million dollar question, literally for some vessels, because they may need to pay one million. O of course, we discussed already in previous panels that this cost will be, at the end, be paid by the end user, but uh, until that, we have a few steps to go. And depending on the various segments, we may see different things. So I would like to ask Jacobo, but of course, anyone please free to jump in the discussion. Who is going to pay that? Who is doing, how are other industries doing that? And what do we see in shipping? This is a very interesting question. Let, let me start by saying something. If you live in the European Union, everyone in this room is already paying for DTS. Just to give you an idea, um, 18 cents per kilowatt is the average price uh, that you're paying in your energy bill every day. So if you live at a home or at your office, 18 cents out of each kilowatt is basically the cost of the environmental certificates that are placed, be that ETS or other type of certificates. In the aviation and industry, um, what we've seen is that ultimately the passengers are taking on this cost. With the shipping industry, of course, it's, it's going to be, in the case of cruises, uh, the, the passengers, but in the other costs, it's going to be um, the, the, the goods. So as linking to what we've heard before, um, considering the ETS, uh, in, let's say, as a com commodity, and in which it is, the best way to integrate this into your strategy as a company is to consider it a full fuel cost. What the industries are doing is considering, uh, considering it a full fuel energy cost. For aviation, it's exactly the same as when they load jet, uh, jet fuel into their, their, um, their tanks. And for the shipping industry, it should be and would be considered uh, the same as an integration into the fuel cost. Being, again, a commodity which is directly linked to the fuel, considering it as a full fuel cost is probably the, 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 best, the best strategy you'll have. Um, depending on the contracts you have in place, be that if you apply BIMCO clause, the standard one which has been discussed lately, um, or other types of agreements, uh, the cost can be passed on. But ultimately, the goods will, uh, uh, will take that on as a price. Basically, one of the biggest discussions we have right now is, is this cost going to fall only on the European, let's say, community, or will this eventually be pushed over? For the moment, I would say, let's stop at the uh, EU level and uh, let's see how this goes. Uh, allow me to make a comment on top of what uh, Jacopo and uh, Frederick said earlier on. Definitely, we are all going to pay uh, at the end of the day. Uh, 
what that uh, means. In simple words, means at least at medium term high inflation rates for whole for the whole Europe, and inevitably higher lending rates. So everybody can see behind the scenes what this is going to mean for the shipping industry. That's for Jacopo. For Frederick, I have to say that um, we in shipping, what we are dealing with is owning and managing ships. EU ETS is a new playground for us. And definitely, we do not want to lose focus from what we've been doing over the last decades. That means owning and managing ships e efficiently and provide the service to the charters. At the end of the day, for sure, pollute the pace, that's a general approach. And as far as uh, our uh, sector is concerned, we are managing 100 ships, 85 of them are containers and 15 are bulkers. We see a positive approach from charters coming back to the cooperation of the stakeholders. And uh, I believe that uh, we will find uh, eventually how we're going to manage uh, EU ETS. For sure, we are not going to be traders, and uh, mainly focusing on our core business is primarily important for all of us. Indeed, indeed, and uh, if I can uh, jump on, on that, obviously, like you correctly said, polluters are, are going to pay, and, and likely the, 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 the entity using the ship on their time charter of voyage charter is going to be the one uh, uh, facing that. But I've heard also too many times owners saying, you know, I'm not concerned about the EU ETS because, by the way, charters are going to pay for it and they're going to buy EUS uh, and transfer the EUS from their trading account to my uh, GSG uh, compliance account. That's a fair comment, but it would be a bit uh, a short sight. Uh, uh, view and, and clearly there are uh, instances where, uh, for example, if a vessel is on the time charter and, and for whatever reason the vessel is getting off fired, then the, it will be during that lapse of period the responsibility of the owner to buy the EUAs. So that means, bottom line, that the owner should be ready in any case to trade, to buy EUAs for him to be able to comply for the period during which is uh, going to be responsible. And when you take the example of the Voyage Charter, the charters are certainly going to be considering covering EUAs from loading port to discharging port, but I'm questioning what is going to be the outcome of the discussion, commercial discussion, between the two entities when it comes to the ballasting leg. You know, it's, uh, I'm not quite sure the uh, charters are going to be willing to pay for the e EU ETS exposure when it comes to the positioning and ballasting legs. So that, these are, that bottom line, I think owners should be ready. Uh, getting ready to trade doesn't mean that you have to trade, but at least you are able to cover these windows during which you have no escape and you need to cover EUS for yourself. For sure, no responsible owner says that I don't care about fuel oil consumption. That, I believe, is totally unrealistic, at least for all the people that they are sitting here. They are very much concerned about efficiency of those ships. And uh, rest assured that uh, there's a tremendous amount of re-engineering, let's say, the total uh, ship management in Greece regarding fuel efficiency of those ships. Uh, I can start talking about uh, ESDs here for another two hours, if you want. And uh, we are trying to, impl to implement a huge number of them with a tremendous amount of cost in our fleet because we want our ships to be very efficient. But at the end of the day, no matter how efficient we try to make our ships, it is the actual operator that governs the whole operations of the ship. A time charter, a, ship, a container time charter to a major operator is obeying the instructions of the charter. If the ship has to go in a port and stays for two or three days idling prior to berthing, that has nothing to do with us. And rest assured, and I'm quite sure you know already, that uh, staying idle for a couple of days definitely destroys the CII rating of the ship. So, yes, we are cooperating with uh, charters in order to effectively implement ESDs on our uh, fleet. And at the same time, 
We advise them proactively about their performance. It is their performance because it is uh, the operational instructions that they give to the vessel that govern the overall efficiency of uh, our vessels. Yeah, so thank you. Just a couple of comments, really, from the regulatory um, perspective. I mean, the question was, who's going to pay? We, we all know we're all going, going to pay. That, that's, that's the answer. But the, the industry lost the argument about the ETS, that the preference of the global industry is for a simple flat rate contribution system, a, a, a levy system, because that provides everyone with certainty. And the difficulty with the ETS, as we've just heard, that the, the volatile and variable um, nature of the cost of this commodity makes it very difficult to predict and very difficult to work out how you um, pass on your costs. The real difficulty is that we're trying to globalise the entire industry and actually the ETS, assuming it's implemented on time, that will only cover about 7.5% of international shipping's emissions. Another interesting statistic I've just remembered is that actually 60% of the allowances, something like that, the majority of the allowances will actually be purchased by non EU ship operators, which adds another dimension. But above all else, it, it does greatly complicate the IMO negotiations. Um, this is probably extremely wishful thinking, but given that IMO has now agreed that it's going to adopt a package of new regulations in 2025, probably including a GHG pricing mechanism, it would be lovely if actually the EU could decide to um, defer the implementation of the ETS for 12 months. Um, I suspect that's wishful thinking, but we live in a strange world and anything can potentially happen. I have a comment to follow up on what you just said. And from my experience from the aviation sector, um, IATA, which we could, uh, similarly to IMO, um, came up with a mechanism called Corsia, which is a global mechanism for um, covering emissions with credits, a different type of credits, not the UAs in this case, and not TTS. And the European uh, Union has put, uh, since 2012, so after the first year where all the flights from and outside the EU, so originating and arriving in the EU on hold, um, has, 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 put, has put that levy on hold. So only intra-EU flights now pay for, for the ETS. Um, because the, the European Union has reserved the right to review how the program of ICAO works. Now, similar, um, if the IMO would come out, potentially, with a mechanism which is satisfactory for the EU, um, and that proves that it uh, covers emission the same way the UTS does, um, it could be, but I can't guarantee that uh, at the moment, that something similar as the aviation happens. So it means that international flight could be put under stop the clock, which is what happened for the aviation sector. Aviation sector doesn't pay for international flights, but only for intra-EU flights. Uh, and if the IMO comes with, up with something like valuable, then this might happen. At the moment, unfortunately, we're, we're not there yet. It's good that we broke schedule, but we had a live discussion. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, one last question to Simon. Uh, we see that both ETS and Fuel EU you will put an artificial cost to owners. They will increase the price with the target to uh, adopt low carbon fuels. Uh, what are your views on how could we bridge the gap between the low carbon fuels and the conventional fuels we burn today? Yeah, I mean, in, in fairness to the European Union, the, the introduction of the ETS has spurred IMO to reach the agreement that it's going to develop some kind of pricing mechanism. The view of ICS is that if money is going to be collected into an IMO fund, rather than just disappear into the hands of governments, that money, as far as possible, should be kept in sector to help the industry decarbonise. So, as Dr Rahim mentioned earlier, um, ICS has come forward with a very comprehensive proposal for what we call a fund and reward mechanism. So, quite simply, all, sh all ship operators would pay a flat rate contribution to an IMO fund, and then the majority of that money would then be used to narrow the price gap between the green fuels and the fuels that we're using today in order to give a, a signal to um, first movers um, 
that, and as I said before, to de-risk um, the investment for first movers um, in the new fuels, because unless we reach this takeoff point by t round about 2030, so that aggressive decarbonisation can happen in the 2030s, it's difficult to see how the 2050 net zero goal can remain plausible. But that, in a nutshell, is the proposal we've put forward to IMO, um, and it's actually very similar to the uh, proposal put forward by the government of Japan, and that's currently being subject to a detailed impact assessment by the IMO. Thank you very much. So I think, uh, trying to recap what we said, we have a rapid acceleration of green fuels. We, we have, but mainly we, we didn't speak so much about CO2 reduction per se, from a technical point of view. We spoke mostly about how to manage the allowances and the emissions. And I think this is similar to the daily discussions we have with ship owners. There is a new language to learn. Uh, it's always good to, new, to learn a new language, but this is a different type. So we will not give exam to British Council, but uh, it will be tested in practice. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank you all for a great panel, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay.